But um, we are, um, we're going to be talking about racial equity today. It's, it's really an opportunity, opportune time to talk about it given um, the COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic. Um, and um, so our objectives today are to um, increase awareness and understanding of racial equity and key concepts, discuss how to influence change through your sphere of influence, understand racial equity as it relates to events occurring in Missouri, that's my job, and discuss tools and practices for addressing racial equity, that's Lauren's job. Um, so I don't know if people pulled together, I guess the poll was not put on here, I asked if a poll can be put on. So one thing before we, so one thing I want everybody to think about, and maybe you can just put this in the chat box, because um, there's not that many people here, is how difficult do you find conversations about race, and why do you think they're difficult? So um, let's put them in the chat box, just so everybody can kind of look at the text as the, they're going, we're going through this slide and they could kind of think about how everybody else is feeling about this, okay? So um, I'm going to start this talk off by talking a little bit about, um, about some of the events that have gone on in, in Missouri. These are, a lot of these are very recent events. And I think in terms of understanding racial equity and, and also being um, competent in terms of dealing with racial equity, you should have a good understanding of some of the events that's, that have occurred um, in the last few years and be aware of them. So um, I think people are pretty aware of what happened in Ferguson. Um, I actually was one of the Ferguson protesters and um, this is a photo of the, the, um, of the um, quick trip that got um, blown up um, and we went, the, me and my husband and daughter went the next day and, um, and what's interesting here is they have um, somebody um, put down all the dates of all the other riots that occurred over the course of the last 40 years. Um, so just a little background on Mike Brown. So part of what had initiated the events in Ferguson was that um, a police officer, um, a young boy who was just about to go start college at Ballarat College, which, mind you, has just closed down in the last few years, um, had um, had basically a uh, police officer had believed that they had stolen, I think it was some sort of cigarette cigarillos, and um, they um, the police officer he did he didn't automatically go along and, and just, you know, get arrested. He left the scene and the police officer just gunned him down. Um, after he shot him several times and killed him, he was left on the street dead for four hours. So um, basically during this time, members of the community mobilized about 200 and they were outside of the police station and they demanded that something be, be done about this. Um, you know, uh, so, um, and because nothing was really done and the, the it was handled really badly and there, you know, there's another thing is nothing was really set in place as procedures of how to handle these kind of situations. Um, it just kind of kept going on and the response continued to, um, to escalate over the, um, over the next few weeks. This is a lot of the pictures that the news media showed you. But when we were on the ground, this is a lot of what we were seeing. Um, a lot of people were coming to this, coming to sort of the center areas of Ferguson. They're gathering, a lot of people were bringing their children. There's my daughter right there. Um, but there were children of all different races and there was kids activities, there was food distributed. There was even some hijinks and people fooling around. But, you know, they had some really serious issues that they were that they were dealing with. Um, one of the things that, you know, that had led up to this is local governments were starving for funding. And so 
and and so one easy way to get funding um, that didn't wasn't very controversial was to just raise funds through different types of fees. That sounds relatively harmless um, when you just think about it, you know. Um, and it basically was a relatively uncontroversial way of raising funding. The problem is that, that a lot of these fees are related to kind of cr uh, crimes where the, you see people walking around. Um, and when there's, there was also a lot of racially charged fear of crime that led to some of, some, some of the fees kind of being more positioned towards African Americans. Another issue was militarization of police departments. We'll talk a little bit about, more about that later. Um, and some of the things that is you're coming up with these fees, but you're actually not hearing from a lot of the folks in the community about how they're going to be affected by these by these fees. So a little history about what goes on in St. Louis. St. Louis is unique um, in terms of its county structure. The county and uh, the St. Louis County is actually um, kind of a, a collaborate uh, coordination of about 90 different municipalities. Many of these municipalities only have about a thousand people in them. Um, and so this all was workable some years ago when there was more federal revenues that came in to support these local departments. Um, but some of these, but since that doesn't happen, you have municipalities that all need these levels of infrastructure and levels of government that cost money. And so they have to raise the money somehow to exist. So, you know, another thing that we want to think about is why did the, uh, why did all, so many municipalities start in this, in, in this area? And one of this is that there was a lot of, of um, race and class um, um, uh, motivation towards starting municipalities. It was a way of basically protecting resources within a community is to start a, a municipality. And that way you don't have to share the rest of your money that you have for your little area with the rest of the county. But one thing is, it's not like you can prevent people from moving in. So people would move in who didn't have as much money and so you, now you have to share with those folks. And so if you're really so stingy about sharing with those folks, then you decide, okay, we're gonna move out and start our own, another municipality. And so this just kept happening. You know, so part of the drive and what, what really kind of caused a lot of these issues is, is you know, somewhere around the 1980s, the federal tax rates went, started going down significantly. So, you know, what, a real problem kind of starts when you have states and municipalities that have different rates. They end up having sort of a race to the bottom. They don't want to, um, they don't want to make it that more wealthy individuals and businesses don't move to their areas. So they, they, they basically compete to make the lowest taxes. I mean, this is kind of where a federal tax kind of allowed there still to be resources in these areas, even if the taxes, they, they kept trying to make the local taxes lower. So we think about that in the 1980s, the, the marginal tax rates were at 90%. If you were, and this is if you were at the wealthiest, wealthiest people, this is the millionaires and billionaires, they had to pay 90% of, um, of their wealth towards, um, towards, um, back to the, the collective pot. Um, the, this rate has gone down to, and I don't know if everybody can see this with the, um, with the, the images, um, but it goes down to about 40%, thir um, 35%, I think it's like 37% now. Um, and so essentially um, the wealthiest people pay 37%. And a lot of them even are found other types of ways to avoid taxes. So there are a lot of the wealthiest, wealthiest don't even pay any taxes at all. They find ways to funnel the money out to other places. So there's a cost to doing this. Um, uh, 
sorry about that. So when, when we go back down to St. Louis County, um, there are about 400,000 active arrest warrants. Warrants usually were kind of issued for people driving without insurance, suspended licenses with um, not having a registration. This is a lot of times when you just didn't have as much money. Um, average fine was around $300. So in St. Louis, we think about that, rent's around 650 to 700, it's a half a month's rent. It was a um, $125 fine for failure to appear. So a lot of people were afraid. So then it would, your, your, your fine would go up to around 400. This wasn't well regulated. And so courts sometimes would just go after everyone and you can just keep getting these and it would keep piling up. So this is on the, this, this creates an incentive for the local police to just kind of really kind of go after really lower income people in the area. So there's these funds, they're also, they're also getting involved for all these other calls. And so it just gets more and more people involved in the justice and it kind of started driving incarcerated populations um, from the 1980s onward. So we see that um, the jail populations start to skyrocket, the prison populations start to skyrocket. And mind you, this is not something that's just going on across the world. The United States has the highest amount of people in prison and in jails across the world. And so, and we want, we have a value of a democratic country, but this doesn't look good for us. Um, this disproportionately affects African Americans. So um, I think the most striking image here is seeing the percentage of black men who have been incarcerated. In the country. Um, so um, they, they make, African Americans make up 1 million of the 2.3 million incarcerated. They're, they're, ten, they're five times as likely um, to, to go to, a pris to a prison for drug related crimes. And um, there are five times as many whites who use drugs, but African Americans are 10 times as likely to go to prison for it. Another thing is, you know, police haven't necessarily taken on as many military tactics. There just is a lot, that, because of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, there had been a lot of money that had gone towards um, military contractors from military supplies. And so basically there's had to be something done with it. It starts to get older and antiquated. The military doesn't want it anymore. So they started going Police departments have to figure, you know, they have all this equipment and they are going after funding for it. So they want to feel like they're using it. Or something. So, you know, during the Ferguson um, protests, you know, essentially the response on the part of police were to come looking like this. And, and you can only imagine how this affects people who say, look, we're citizens in this country and you're using your military. It looks like you're using your military against us for our First Amendment rights. You know, um, during this time, yeah. Austin, Ferguson, um, about 70 I get off at four, so if I go to Orishland, then I'll probably be home more like five. Hi, everybody. Um, can you please turn your mute on your, um, on your thing? Um, so 70% of, um, in the population in Ferguson, 70% of the population was African American, while 50 of the 53 police officers in the area were white. Five of Ferguson's six city council members were white. The mayor of Ferguson was white and Republican, while most of them, most of the population was Democrat. And 83% of the Ferguson's voters voted for Obama in the election. So most of them were technically Democrat. There might be some independents in there. Turnout in the last municipal election in Ferguson was 11.7%. Um, there was a lot of money put into this, you know, that, that had driven these elections. Um, 
And, um, you know, there, there had also been kind of occurring around this time some Supreme Court decisions which weakened Voting Rights Act, which made it that people were less likely to be protected, like polling places, they could close them down, they could start issuing kind of requirements in order to vote that that kind of already further reduces the amount of people who are able to vote, especially if they're more vulnerable populations. Sorry, I'm kind of just getting a sense of this PowerPoint. Um, there were some positive things that came out of this. So after, so, you know, the, the, essentially the protests went on until about, um, until there was a, um, the, the police officer was supposed to get indicted. And um, it took a while for them to figure, to, for this to go through the grand jury. And the grand jury, um, uh, you know, under the, um, under much of the leadership of the, the prosecutor at the time, who really did not want to prosecute a police officer, um, he, they basically decided not to indict. And, and, you know, usually indictments actually are much more common. Um, somebody has, people have, have said before that you can indict a, a um, ham sandwich if you want to. So, and because most of the time, the grand jury just agrees with what the prosecutor said. So if the prosecutor is already making this decision to, to basically influence against indictment, it's going to be no indictment. So this is where things really exploded. And um, during that time, um, you know, a few good things happened. One, um, a lot of the city and county officials together and they, they created the, the Ferguson Commission. Another good thing that happened was people really started getting more motivated to vote and there, there were a lot of leaders that came out of these protests who went on to run for um for um different um local level elections um including the st louis county prosecutor so we have the first african-american st louis county prosecutor um in, in history in 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 our air in the st louis county area um, the St. Louis, the Ferguson Commission report also made some recommendations, which is also kind of, you know, some of the things that when we think about racial equity and we think about them in some of the urban areas, but they also can be very well translated into many of the rural areas of Missouri um, that we want to think about. So there's justice for all. Um, you know, there's, there needs to be more focus on police reform, court reform, issues within these different municipal courts, which kind of can run like fiefs, fiefdoms. Um, another, another thing is we need to focus on youth and, and child well-being and education. So improving um, education systems, but also ensuring that there are, um, there are programs for youth to do. AHEC is a really good example of these type of programs for youth that build them into, um, you know, careers where they can be successful. But, you know, the, the city and the county started actually putting quite a lot of resources into programs that were after school and summer programming um, to kind of build on this. And this is, this can be also a, a thing that to think about with AHEC. There's also, you know, more, this is more the conversations that people have begun having. We need to have more economic mobility. Expansion of Medicaid is important. People need to have access to healthcare. Um, employment is important. There needs to be, um, you know, more access to employment, financial empowerment, housing and transportation. So, I want to also talk a little bit about other communities in Missouri. Um, St. Louis isn't the only community that has racial issues. Um, we're going to have a lot of them across the state. Um, one of the other communities that I've been working in more recently is in the Boot Hill area. And, um, you know, there has been some referral to the Boot Hill as being sort of an undiscovered Appalachia. And maybe part of the reason why there is this this term of Appalachia given is because it there's a it borders so many of the other states where 
there is a little bit of Appalachia, there's a little bit of, um, of, of the, the Black Belt, um, all kind of revolving in it. Um, and so as a result, there are severe socioeconomic challenges that many of these counties in the boot hill need to face. Um, one of the things to think about is the Missouri Compromise, um, you know, of why the, the, the Boot Hill is like this. So when the Missouri, but the, the Boot Hill is basically at the parallel of 36 degrees 30 north. And this is the line that was decided where we would have a slave state versus a, a, um, a, um, a free state. And so it's just right under it. So basically, it was kind of vague whether slavery was permitted or not permitted. And, but many of the people who had power essentially were, on the, were slaveholders. And so they ensured that there was the perspective that this was permitted here. And, you know, and so slavery essentially continued. And the perspective around it, a lot of that perspective, and a lot of those powerful people remained. Um, but there are some really interesting parts of the, the Boot Hill history um, in relation to um, in relation to um, to, um, to, ra to racial equity. One of the things that happened during this time was the shareholder that happened during the press the depression. And to some degree, this kind of reminds me of some of the COVID nineteen legislation that's coming out right now. Was the sharecroppers roadside protest of 1939. So um, during this time, um, during the Great Depression, there was, there was relief given to landowners um, for, for some of their, um, their farming. But, um, and you know, we can kind of think of this as like businesses getting relief, but they don't give anything to workers. Um, so there's, you know, we can say 400, we, we give 750 billion goes to businesses for relief, but workers get 50 million and they all have to scrounge and fight for that. Well, you know, they had been a little bit more mindful during the stimulus in, you know, during this time, it still probably could be better in my opinion. But um, during that time, they completely disregarded um, sharecroppers and they just didn't care if they ate or not. So they got the relief the farmers were required not to use their land. So because there had been um, a lot of, they had to let their land rest for a little while. And um, there was nothing given to the share, the sharecroppers. So they occupied the um, highways for um, a certain number of time. And it was about a thousand of them that occupied that, that area. Later, Lincoln University provided some collective land to the sharecroppers um, as, sort of a means of, of alleviating the issue, but there was never really a, a federal response. It, it was basically coming from the community. And this is sometimes a lot of times what ends up happening, right? So more recently, um, I, I don't, Megan might know more about this, um, but uh, there, I think it was Sykeston. Um, we were gonna look it up. One of the towns in the Boot Hill area had um, its first black mayor. And so um, this is a recent, um, uh, this is a newspaper, this is actually a, a weekly news, a newspaper in um, St. Louis called the Riverfront Times. They had an article called Boot Hill Burning. And essentially it was about this, this first black mayor who, um, you know, kind of a similar thing that happened in Ferguson. They finally had gotten together, people in the community gotten together and there had been they had finally been able to elect a, a black person in what had been a large percentage black town. And um, the, um, the mayor of the, it's, people were not happy with this mayor and the city hall was blown up and the mayor's house was blown up. They essentially tried to run her out of town. You know, this ends up getting translated into health and senior social services. So when you, as health professionals, this is what you end up seeing on your side. 
So here's a New York Times article about the Boot Hill. And it actually talks about how several of the hospitals had to close down because they're just, they, they couldn't afford to um, support themselves. There was no Medicaid expansion in the state. So they you know, they relied heavily on Medicaid. And when there were, there was no way to compensate for people who didn't have money, they basically just had to eat those costs. So, so many of these hospitals were closing that if you were going to have a baby, you had to go about a hundred miles. I mean, it's very dangerous. This is actually one of the um, doctors, you know, who is um, in the area, who is sort of well known. And um, he was interviewed for that same New York Times article. It's an interesting article you should read if you have a chance. Um, you know, the, this also kind of creates this situation where people, um, you know, they, they keep hearing about hospitals closing and there's so much instability that the, the hospitals actually have to put up signs and say they're still gonna be here. I mean, that's, you know, this should tell you something. And, you know, they don't even, and sometimes you have to have what are considered sort of these temporary facilities. That this is a temporary facility that some of the health professionals in the area actually put up their own money to set up so that there's something in the community for people. Um, so, you know, we're kind of concluding here, you know, we see in, in Missouri general health and we, you could say, you could kind of take your social determinants of health perspective and say, are these rates for, for African Americans higher, given all this information we're talking about now, given what we know about social determinants of health, because of something they're doing, or is there something structurally going on? So I'm going to leave the floor over for Lauren to continue this discussion. Is my screen? Yeah, I can see it. Okay. <coughs> Sorry about that. All right. Um, you, where's full screen? Um, I think you just go to home. Um, oh, maybe not. Um, I should. Wait, oh, there it is. There it is. Slideshow. All right. So, um, yeah, I'll be talking a little bit about the key terms. So, um, you know, diversity is essentially just differences in social identity, and that includes race, gender, gender expression, ethnicity, um, and so forth. And then inclusion is ensuring that those with diverse backgrounds have access, you know, and the ability to contribute and engage to the communities in which they live and cultural competency is, you know, the ability to interact with different um, cultures, both respectfully and um, effectively. And cultural humility is the perspective, you know, that um, involves lifelong learning, self-reflection, critique, and just being comfortable with, um, with not knowing and acknowledging the dynamics of, of power and, and privilege. Um, and then structural competency um, is essentially the, you know, political and economical structures and the capacity to respond um, broadly to all different social um, people, all to people with social, you know, different social backgrounds and whatnot. Um, implicit bias, uh, the thoughts and feelings that we have that were on, toward people that were unaware of and and how do these impact um, how do these impact our work in our practice and with patients and who we hire and who we who we live around so being aware of um, implicit bias um, Lauren so um, they're able to set up the poll. So um, do we want to just go and tell them to go ahead and set up the poll and maybe just take a little break and let people do the poll? Yeah. And what question? The question was, um, do we feel comfortable talking about race? Okay. So um, uh, there we go.
And how do we see the poll? Do you see? Um, it's when, when they get everybody in, when people have, there's enough answers, they can go ahead and send it. So we could maybe just, you can kind of go on and explain some more of these. And then when it, the results come in, we can okay. let everybody know how that is. And then maybe once people kind of see where people are, we'll, we'll ask them to maybe add some stuff to the chat box. Okay. So 23 of 28 people have voted right now. So okay. I, can, I would just go ahead and end it. it. Yeah, go ahead and end it. Let's go look at it. And what? The uh, poll. There we go. So do you feel uncomfortable? About 30% feel uncomfortable. And 70% are much more comfortable talking about race. So I, it seems like we have more people feeling comfortable talking about race. Uh, maybe we can ask some of the folks why they feel comfortable talking about it. And they can add that to the chat box. And you can, if you feel uncomfortable, you can also add some stuff too. Okay. And um, that would just be great if you have some of those stuff. It would just, just so everybody can sort of see the different perspectives. And the Im implicit bias, you know, because race is a difficult topic to talk about. It's very emotionally charged for obvious reasons that Carissa had um, talked about. But um, I guess moving along to equality and equity, this this image um, right here, I think, speaks volumes when it um, looks at, you know, how, how do we allocate resources to to best help, you know, everyone kind of given given where they are with with life circumstances. So, you know, equality belief that, you know, one's social characteristics that we're all equal and should be tr treated as such or equity. Um, you know, would be the state in which no longer, race no longer predicts outcomes. Um, and with this, with this slide, it shows essentially, you know, what it looks like with different communities and how different communities look different um, and how, how are resources allocated toward those communities. Um, and as you can see, in the equality box on the left, that there are fewer, um, buildings in this cityscape, whereas, you know, equity on, on the right, you can see that the more densely kind of populated area has, has more, more resources going to it. And that's ideally what, what it should look like, but not always our reality, unfortunately. Um, well, not just the density, but also the need for, for, um, for different things. Because, I mean, in a lot of rural communities, there's real significant needs there, too. And there needs to be a response to that. So let me just go to the next slide. Yeah, so what does it mean to use a racial equity lens? So just talking about it and acknowledging the needs and different levels of oppression and what that, what that looks like um, from a perspective, including, you know, individuals, um, institutional, societal, and how, how can we use that racial equity lens to put, put race at the center and don't shy away from discussions that, that impact race, as it's obviously very important for the patients and um, the healthcare system and people that, that we work with. And and also um, to kind of expand on that more, looking at all of the different factors that play into an individual's life, you know, the neighborhood, um, access to healthy foods, crime and violence, um, economic stability, uh, and resources, job opportunities in a particular area, education, um, access to education, and what does that social and community context look like, uh, family structure, um, civic participation, and so forth, and then obviously health and health care. Um, is there access to primary care or healthcare services in certain areas. So having that racial equity lens um, and looking through this kind of biopsychosocial um, model can, can help us. Um, and I think St. Louis, I just read a headline um, the other day that illustrated the um, disparities of COVID cases by um, race, ethnicity, and Missouri has about uh, two times higher the rate of 
um, African Americans who have been um, who've had COVID as compared to um, a Caucasian patient. So there are huge disparities in regard to the pandemic that we're all living through right now. Um, and again, what does it mean again to use the racial equity lens? And this includes both both strategies upstream and um, and then different kind of tactics and things downstream. So what is what does that look like? Um, so the strategies in, include you know <clears throat> different different needs and how um, we can try to go upstream and have an impact downstream by looking at the laws and policies and things in place that Krista talked about earlier that ultimately impact, um, you know, things, things downstream, including, you know, what clinical care could eventually look like and so forth. Um, so anything else to expand on that slide, Carissa? Oh, you're muted. Unmute. We can go back up it. I mean, it's also thinking about this, you know, just in the way that you are practicing um, your clinical care. I think, you know, we're, we're going to go in a little bit about, you know, um, some of this information, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of judgment that is used within clinical care. And I think, you know, uh, me and Lauren come from social work. So one of the things that we are, we learn in social work, and, and and not all health professions learn this, is is how to how to do care without judging people. And um, it's not an easy thing skill to learn, but it is vital to in terms of engaging um, patients. It's vital engage of in terms of building trust, and so. When we, when we were thinking about clinical care, that's just at the very baseline, but you know, it goes up to what goes on communities. People listen to you as health profession, professionals and what you say about, um, about many different things, especially now. So this is really the time to talk about issues like racial, race equity, especially you know, when we're talking about COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So go ahead, Lauren. You could go to the next slide. And so how do we talk about race? We, we talk about it, um, you know, getting used to being comfortable um, talking about it. So obviously, you know, personal comfort um, is not at the center of discussion and won't help things get better for people. So that's why, you know, being vulnerable and having some of those tough conversations can be helpful and ultimately um, being able to have that empathy, you know, when, when anyone walks in an exam room or is presents, you know, in an, in a healthcare setting. So, um, and then also acknowledging that everyone has, has bias and, you know, question, um, what's the outcome of that and then what can be done to reduce the bi the bias and then tolerance is a is a muscle without it um without exercise it, it doesn't get stronger so you know being able to um to have that and and exercise that is is important um moving moving forward getting comfortable so I just want to add a couple things. You know, um, I think sometimes you hear there's a sort of an attitude towards having a lot of tolerance and love and empathy for other people. But, you know, I think me and Lauren were having this discussion and it isn't necessarily natural to feel that way. It, it, there's sort of a natural feeling. I, I see my child because my child is like the most intolerant. Like she just wants everything her way and she wants it to just benefit her. And then she's not happy. That's something that you have to build over time. And it's something I feel like I even have to work on. It, it takes a lot. And so it's something to be mindful of. I mean, even just like thinking about your neighbors, if you're really close to them, you really have to build that tolerance mu muscle. When you're further apart, you, you, the tolerance muscle gets weak, you know? <laughs> um, 
So just uh, just a thought on the you know the whole thought the whole issue of of what we mean by that. Go on, Tom. Um, you can go on, um, Lauren. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I know it happened to me too. It's like you get you get confused. <laughs> um, so this is a just a great tool, Clara. You know that's quick self check. Uh, check your pulse. Take a deep breath, listen actively, you know, affirm some component, uh, respond to what was said and add to the response in a way that moves the discussion forward. So um, a quick tool, you know, for that constant self check and, um, you know, especially when, um, you know, learning and acknowledging maybe some of those implicit biases that we might have. This is, this is a really good tool when you get into discussions about um, about race and you're you're getting upset so it's I think this is a cool tool that you use where you just say okay time to take a take a let's take a break take a deep breath check your pulse and then start listening actively to the next person you know the affirmation of the other person's perspective is really important in these conversations for it to start moving forward Go on, Lauren. And the last um, few slides are just some some resources for um, for people. So unpacking white privilege and um, some books. I know there's another on the last slide too. Some some websites. Um, Chris, I didn't know if you wanted to mention anything more about some of the resources. Yeah, I mean, there's some of them that that you know are are ones that I are kind of my all time. Favorites. One of them. Um, one of them is this really great book. So I always like People's History of the United States because it just goes into many different groups in the U.S. And um, and what you see in that is that there's always a sort of a continued struggle of all these different groups to just you know get what they need. Um, and and this will continue on, you know. And there is sort of a feeling of we're all in this together. Um, but we also need to be each other's allies. And it's not always about us all the time. Um, you know, another really good book that I like in here is The Birth of the Nation. This is a little bit more fun of a book. It's, it's actually a comic. And it's about um, a group of people in East St. Louis who take over and make East St. Louis a separate nation. Um, and so it's really interesting. It's a really interesting um, critique on race in the U.S. Um, and it, you know, sometimes humor helps to, to kind of change your defensiveness on some of these issues. Um, and there's also some reports that came out during Ferguson. One of them is for the sake of all, and there's also the Ford through Ferguson kind of gives you a sense of sort of um, some ideas about where we're, th what we're, th what, what a lot of thinkers in this area in this specific region are thinking about race and racial equity. So I think that's all we have. Does anyone want to um, anyone want to say anything? Or I, I know this is a lot, and I have to you know say you know, this is me and Lauren's perspective. You know, but there, we're also using a lot of tools that um, have been used um, throughout to just bring up the topic of of racial equity. So, um, you know, it, it is important to kind of open the floor right now if people want to say anything. And so we're just going to kind of leave it to, t to let people open the floor and no nobody has anything to say or any responses. That's okay, too. I think this is definitely a salient topic given the state of times with COVID and um, how different states are responding to things. And so I'm even just curious too on their thoughts, comments about um, Missouri in general and how, you know, we're dealing with this pandemic and looking through that racial equity lens. Hello, can you guys hear me okay? This is Cassandra yeah. in Southwest. Hi, Cassandra. Um, hi, um, just wanted to, um, just highlight an experience, a personal experience, um, more so along the lines of cultural competency. Um, so in acting, um, historically in acting as a patient advocate uh, for a stepdad and trying to establish him as a new patient in a rural setting, family practice, um, the clerical staff 
was very um, judgmental and immediately jumped to, oh, well, we don't prescribe narcotics. Right. And I just was very taken back by that. Um, the fact that he was diabetic, he had cancer, um, had multiple issues and other factors, um, you know, was just really disheartening um, because I was trying to provide some continuity and care because he had his previous provider had been left and now we were trying to, you know, keep him going and trying to care for him as best as we could. And, and it was just, well, we don't prescribe narcotics right. was like, you know, nothing about this patient, please take a step back, you know, and I think it just opens up a lot for increasing cultural competency um, even among the clerical staff to just say, you know, what are your needs and being, you know, empathetic to that and just trying to just do the best that you can to look at the situation and look at the patient and not jump to conclusions. Um, because if he had called and she had said that to him, he would have hung up the phone and that would have been it. I know. And uh, it's just really, this is we just have a long way to go. Yeah. This yep. is how you push people away and they don't want to come back. Absolutely. I mean, when you push them away once, that's it, you know. Well, and if there's zero trust on the front line, there, that's just going to carry through to the provider. And that lack of trust is just going to carry forward. And so it just, it's just a, a really stark reminder that we all have a long way to go. Yeah. But I appreciate the lecture. Thank you. Thank you. We want, does anyone else want to share anything or just have any comments? So we have about nine more minutes. Does anybody have any questions? I don't know if I would be able to answer them, but you know, maybe, maybe there's something that we know of or a resource that, we, that me and Lauren know of. I actually, I'll put um, an article in the chat box. I haven't um, been able to, I, just came across this, I think. Oh, I sent that to you, Krista. Sorry. Um, um, on it's bostonreview.net. I came across it somewhere on, on LinkedIn and sent it to myself just a, a few before this um, presentation. But I think it's, it's interesting that the, the, the nation is looking at Missouri in regard to the racial disparities and, and COVID at, at this point. So um some extra reading materials there if anyone is interested hi this is janice hi janice. Cass, that was a great comment i have a question for you do schools cover any kind of cultural competency competency or you know awareness of of race differences i know there's so much in clinical programs that you have to cover clinically, and so, so often um, these other important things um, are, there's just no time for them, but do they cover them in any that you know of, any programs? Well, I mean, I can speak a little bit. I think, you know, I think the issue with schools is they're run at local districts, and local districts have some discretion over whether or not people um people get these kind of trainings um one of the things that thinking about some um some one of things that cassandra said about medical assistance and people who are do, who are kind of on this front line they actually get very little training a lot of times their programs are not even a year long so um you know, thinking about this, this is there, there isn't as much opportunity to ensure that they get this kind of um, competency when they're going in, even though people a lot of times talk to the medical assistants and this, this frontline clerical staff more than they talk to the health professionals themselves. So, I mean, and this sort of runs into another issue is that you're also talking about medical assistants who are a lot of times paid um, sometimes up to minimum wage and sometimes it goes to around $15 an hour, but they're a lot of times not paid very well either. So there's not a huge incentive to keep getting um, new trainings or to kind of stay abreast of the field unless you're really 
you know, wanting to kind of use this, you know, these medical assistance jobs as sort of a pipeline into health professions. And I think that that speaks to the need for, um, you know, community organizations, practices, you know, system, system wide, you know, um, to be inclusive of all staff and all providers, whether it be people picking up the phone, um, you know, all of the providers, uh, you know, being able to have some, some sort of training and, and streamlining and, um, and maybe other certain agencies are more um, privy to that being in different settings and whatnot, but a lot of work to be done, I think, in with education and the healthcare system in that regard. Any other comments or feedback in regard to today's? Well, we have, um, we are both, um, I think um, you, our information is available through, I mean, you, you, um, if you wanna, um, if you wanna get a hold of us and talk to either of uh, me or Lauren um, later on, just, um, just reach out to your, um, your scholars, your AHEC Scholars Center, and they'll just give you our um, contact information. But I'll put, I can also put it in the box. This is my email address. Um, oops, I just sent it to Lauren. I need to send it to everyone. Um, so if, if there's anyone who wants to, you know, have a conversation afterwards or anything like that, I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm available, Lauren's available. And, um, you know, I think this is, this is a very important discussion we need to just keep having. And it was wonderful to see everybody and wonderful to see so many people come. And um, I hope everyone has a good afternoon. Thank you all for your time today and opportunity to talk about this topic. All right. Thank well, you thank very you. much.